Good morning, everyone. Hosea chapter 9 with me in your Bibles. The book of Hosea, the Old Testament book of Hosea with me in your Bibles, please. It's so good to see so many here for our first service in this building this morning. For those of you who it is your first time, we pray that it would not be your last time and that by God's grace you would come and visit us once again, hopefully sometime in the very near future. But we're so glad to have you, especially those of you whom it is your first time here at Hope Community Church. This is a time of transition for us, but God has been faithful so far and we know that he will continue to be faithful. Hosea chapter 9. Uh, last week I began a message and I preached the first half of that message and Lord, Lord, Lord willing, this week I plan to preach the second half of that message. Our text is verse number one to verse number six. We will be focusing on verse four to six specifically this Sunday, but I'm going to read the entire text of scripture just to remember our context of the passage that we are looking at. So Hosea chapter nine, I'm going to begin reading at verse number one. And here's what it says. It says, rejoice not, O Israel. Exalt not like the peoples, for you have played the whore, forsaking your God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. Threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail them. They shall not remain in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean food in Assyria. Now verse 4 to 6 is what we will focus on today. It says, they shall not pour drink offerings of wine to the Lord, and their sacrifices shall not please him. It shall be like mourner's bread to them. All who eat of it shall be defiled. For their bread shall be for their hunger only. It shall not come to the house of the Lord. What will you do on the day of the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of the Lord? For behold, they are going away from destruction. But Egypt shall gather them, Memphis shall bury them, nettles shall possess their precious things of silver, thorns shall be in their tents. The title of this message is Floods of Fury, and this is part two. Let us pray. Our God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for us being here this morning in a brand new location. And Heavenly Father, as we gather around to hear from the preaching of your word, I pray that you would use me in a special way. I pray that you would guide my thoughts. I pray that you would guide my speech. I pray that there would be clear communication and understanding on the part of my audience. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would all leave here changed, not by me, but by your word. I pray, Heavenly Father, that this church would continue to go deeper into the word of God, that we would stand upon that foundation and never leave it. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would blow our minds with what you do through people who love the Word of God, understand the Word of God, and seek to live the Word of God as Christians. Help us this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Last week, we looked at part one of this message, Floods of Fury. And the main idea behind the message is simply this. A refusal to repent leaves the imminent door to judgment wide open. We began to make several observations from this one passage of scripture. Observation number one was called the command. Israel was commanded not to participate in any celebration whatsoever. They were not to be joyous. They were not to be happy. They were not to be any of those things because they had been unfaithful, the nation of Israel, they had been unfaithful to their love relationship with their God. Point number two was the consequences. Israel was about to face the repercussions for their rebellion. They would not remain in the land that God had sovereignly given to them hundreds of years before, but instead they would be taken away captive into Assyria. There they would not have the the opportunity to obey all of the dietary laws because, again, they were rebellious and they did not seek the Lord. God had had enough and they would pay the consequences for that. Well, we're still under that second heading, the consequences, so now we're gonna go back to verse number four. We're gonna transpose, sorry, we're gonna transmit ourselves to verse number four. It says, they shall not pour drink offerings of wine to the Lord. So Hosea continues to elaborate on what life 
for the Jews will be like outside of the promised promise land, outside of the land that God had given to them. The drink offerings mentioned here was a part of their sacri sacrificial system, and it would cease when they entered into exile. So again, yet again, we see that when they leave the land, the opportunity to be fully obedient to God will leave them. They won't have the opportunity to obey God in every way possible as, as he had ordained from the beginning when he birthed the nation. Verse 4 goes on. It says, and, and their sacrifices shall not please him. Him meaning God. So obviously, this is also a reference to the Old Testament sacrificial system. And I believe it probably shines a light on the specific animals that were sacrificed under the sacrificial system. But let's pump the, pump the brakes. Let's be reminded that during this period of time, syncretism was taking place. Syncretism, now that's a big word, but all that means is simply this. The Jews, God's people at this time, were taking Jewish worship, which was true worship, authentic worship, given to them by God, and they were mixing that with Baal worship, false worship, idolatrous worship. So they took true worship and false worship and they put it together and that is what is known as syncretism. And that is what was taking place during the period of Hosea's ministry. How could they please God if this was the case? This kind of worship was detestable in God's eyes. They will be wasting their time when they go into exile by sacrificing to the Lord. It will have no impact upon God whatsoever. It will all be like a chasing after the wind. It has no impact upon the God that they're supposed to be serving once they go away into Assyria. But the verse continues. It says, it shall be like, get this, it shall be like mourner's bread to them. All who eat of it shall be defiled. Now, according to the Levitical law, Old Testament law, anything or anyone who had contact with the dead was considered unclean for a specific period of time. So anything or anyone who touched a dead body or any dead carcass, a man or animal, was considered unclean. So bread that was handled by those who may have mourned dead loved ones, let's say like at a funeral, that bread itself would also be classified as unclean. That kind of bread, because it was touched, was defiled. And this is how God will view Israel's attempt at animal sacrificing in exile. It will be like an unclean substance. In other words, Hosea is building a metaphor here. What he's saying is sacrificial offerings in my sight, this is what, what God is saying, in my sight is equal to defiled bread. It upsets me. It's dead to me. It's ungodliness. It means nothing to God, and it is refused by him. It will be refused by him when they head over into exile against their wishes. It says also, continuing on in that verse, it says, for their bread shall be for their hunger only. So they will only be able to use bread to fill their stomachs. That bread only serves a natural purpose for them and will not serve any spiritual purpose for them while they are in exile. Therefore, what is meant is this. Their efforts at sacrificing are nothing more than futile. Again, it's all a striving after the wind. Oh, we're going to sacrifice to God. We're going to make offerings to God. Number one, those offerings were probably syncretistic, meaning there was the mixing of false religions with it. Secondly, God had had enough. And all of the trying to offer offerings to God by this time in Hosea's min ministry and by this time in Israel's history will be too late. They will pay, unfortunately, the consequences for their sin. That same verse goes on. It says, it, it shall not come to the house of the Lord. Now, the house of the Lord there, normally someone would think it's a reference to the temple, the Jewish temple. 
But in the present context, the house of the Lord probably means, it probably is a reference to the land, the very land, the promised land that God gave to the nation of Israel. And if we were to go back to verse 3, same chapter, verse 3, we would see where it speaks about the land of the Lord. They shall not remain in the land of the Lord. Most scholars believe, most dependable scholars believe that the house of the Lord is a reference to the land itself, not necessarily the temple. Therefore, the bread that this generation eats, which equals the sacrifices that they make to the Lord, will no longer again enter the Lord's land when it comes to this particular generation. It will remain outside. They will remain outside as outcasts. Just as the people go, so go their provisions. God will send the children, children of Israel and everything they own into exile. And it's almost as if he puts up a off-limits sign, a do-not-enter sign over the land that he had pre previously given to them because they had defiled his land. They had not been obedient while they were in the land that God had given to them. Now they will be pushed out. They will be forced out. They will be taken into bondage against their will. And God will say, in a sense, no more of that here. Not for this generation. So first of all, we saw the command last week. We saw the consequences. And now three, let's see the catastrophe. There is calamity. There is a sad situation that is imminent for the nation. Look at verse number five there. Still in chapter 9, it goes on. It says, what will you do on the day of the appointed festival, on the day of the feast of the Lord? Now, this is a rhetorical question. And if we know anything about rhetorical questions, it doesn't mean that an answer is expected. Well, here, in all, in all actuality, a statement is being made. There is nothing that Israel will be able to do on this day. All their efforts, all their energies will be worthless. Now, we must stop here and examine, some, examine something. There's a term used here. Two terms, actually. Day of the appointed festival, there in that verse. And it also says, day of the feast of the Lord. What do these terms mean? Well, I believe personally that both of these terms are referencing the same event, the same feast. What is that feast? There's differences of opinion amongst Bible scholars regarding what this particular feast is, but I personally believe that this feast is what is known as the Feast of Booths. If you have some, some translations would call it the Feast of Tabernacles. So Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles, they, they both mean the same thing. They're referencing the same event. Now, what was the Feast of Booths or what was the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, it was simply a festival that was instituted to remember the journeying of the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. If we were to go back into Old Testament history, we would know that the Israelites were in bondage to the Egyptians, and then they left Egypt through Moses' leadership, and they crossed the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness, and the Bible talks about what happens during that period of time and also after that period of time, but it's a, it was approximately 40 years by which they spent time in the wilderness and one generation died out and the next generation was risen up and after that next generation was risen up, then they entered into the promised land. Well, this Feast of Booths or this Feast of Tabernacles was to commemorate, was to remember that time that they spent in the wilderness. Now, I believe that there are two reasons to assume that, that that is what this passage of Scripture is talking about when it says the day of the appointed festivals or the day of the Feast of the Lord. Reason number one, and I've said this before and I'm going to continue to say it, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. And what that means is if you read something in the Bible in one portion and you don't understand what it is saying, Oftentimes, you can get clarity on that verse of Scripture you don't understand by going to another verse of Scripture somewhere later on or maybe even previously in the Bible. So the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. 
what we're going to do is we're going to cheat a little bit this morning. We have not looked at this passage of scripture yet, but we're going to go further in Hosea and cheat a little. So I want you to flip over to Hosea chapter 12. Hosea chapter 12, and just look at verse number 9. It should only be a few flips in your, in your Bible. Hosea chapter 12. Now let's look at verse number 9. It says, I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. Now get, get, get what it says here. It says, I will again make you dwell in tents. As in, pay close attention, as in the days of the appointed feasts. So, this verse here, verse 9, ends with the term appointed feasts. Both words are used in the other passages of Scripture that we're looking at back in chapter 9. Appointed feasts. So we see there is something that both of these passages of Scripture or verses of Scripture have in common. The second thing is that the specific feast that is mentioned here in Hosea chapter 12, verse 9, it is said that they dwell in tents. The word tents is used there. And the word tents is the same word as the word booths. These tents that they set up for this special feast could also be considered as booths. So I think that's the first reason why we, we can consider this to be the feast of booths. The second reason is in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 13. You don't have to turn there, but I'll read it for you. Deuteronomy 16, verse 13. Again, we're seeing commonality, something that's common in two passages of Scripture. It says there, you shall keep the feast of booths, the, first, the, the festival we're talking about, seven days. And then it says, when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press. There in Deuteronomy, it mentions not only the Feast of Booths, but it mentions a, a wine press and a threshing floor. Now, if those of you who were here for our last message, if you remember the last message, you would know that we looked at two verses that had both of those themes in it, the threshing floor and the wine press. If we go right back to verse number two of chapter nine, it says, threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them. The new wine shall fa fail them. Again, we're seeing some common themes here. So I believe that the Feast of Booths is what is represented by that particular feast. There you go. We just did a little quick Bible study. Verse six, it says, for behold, they are going away from destruction. Now, it seems that some of the Israelites would try to escape going into exile. They would try to escape going into bondage to Assyria by fleeing to Egypt. And the reason they went to Egypt because, was because at this time, Egypt was considered to be their allies. Egypt was considered to be their friends. So they, free, they flee, some of them, not all of them, most of them went to Assyria, but they flee to Egypt in order to avoid bondage to Assyria. But notice the verse goes on. Here's what it says. There's a but there. <laughs> but shows contrast. It says, but Egypt, here's what Egypt will do to them. But Egypt shall gather them. And then it says, Memphis shall bury them. So they will be received in Egypt. But notice what the ultimate goal will be when they get to Egypt. The ultimate, ultimate goal will be their demise. In other words, they're going to lose their lives in Egypt, those that actually do get to go to Egypt. They're going to leave their, lose their lives there. The city of Memphis is mentioned here in this text. Memphis is the place where their bodies will be buried. Memphis was a popular city back in the days of the Egyptian, in the days of the Egyptians in which the Old Testament speak. It was located on the River Nile, and Memphis was notorious for having this huge, this gigantic graveyard. That's one thing Memphis was known for back in these times. And so what the text really hints at is there will be a whole lot of space to bury these Israelite bodies. So you go to Egypt, fine. When you get there, they're actually going to bury you, Israel, for those who actually do get to go there. Notice that this is the same Egypt that they had unholy alliances with, but now 
their fake friendship is over. Their fake friendship with Egypt has now been overturned. We learned previously that they, were, they considered Egypt their friends, but unfortunately, when push comes to shove and they need help, Egypt will not be there for them. Egypt will abandon them, and not only will Egypt abandon them, as it says there, Egypt will bury them. Again, those who sin with you will also sin against you. Those who gossip with you will probably gossip about you. Trust no sinful alliance, because in the end, sinful alliances will strike you back like a cobra. The husband who commits adultery must not think that his mistress will always look upon him favorably. The worker who commits fraud must not assume that their co-workers will always remain silent about the fraud that they've conspired in together. Those who sin with you will also sin against you. Sin has no allegiances to anybody but itself. And the verse goes on. It says, Nettles shall possess their precious things of silver. Thorns shall be in their tents. The nettles spoken of here are the wild weeds that will grow up because Israel has been taken away into exile and there's nobody to take care of the land. Think about even Longford. Let's just say everybody who spends time in Longford or around Longford leaves for 10 years. This place will have all kinds of trees growing up in the middle of the street and all, all kinds of things going on. The buildings will, di will dilapidate and things just like that. That's what's going on here. Things grow up, bushes grow up, weeds grow up because nobody's taking care of the place. The precious things spoken of here are believed to be the idols of silver that they committed whoredom with that they were unfaithful to God with. They were supposed to serve the one and only true God, but they brought in these idols and they bowed, out, bowed down to them and they worshiped them. The thorns further represent a land that has been abandoned and it is left wanting. God's judgment will leave this piece of land, which was known as the promised land or which we know to be the promised land, it will leave it overgrown while the people are slaves in the Assyrian Empire or to the Assyrian Empire for a number of years. Sounds dreary, doesn't it? Sounds depressing. It sounds, quite frankly, hopeless. And in all honesty, <laughs> that's the reality of life. It's dreary, it's depressing, it's hopeless outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You take the gospel of Jesus Christ and what God has done for sinful human beings out of the world and out of our existence and life is nothing but a mess. There's no meaning to life. No matter what you put your trust in, no matter what you put your happiness in, you will eventually hit a brick wall one way or the other. And if you don't hit it in this life, you will eventually hit it in the life to come. Life is depressing. Life is hopeless. Life is worthless outside of the glorious message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the problem with this world can all be summed up in one little word. One little three-letter word. It's S-I-N. Sin. That's the problem. And by the way, that's not only the problem with the people out there. That's the problem with the people, you and I, in here. We have the same issue. We have the same problem. We are all sinners by nature. We are all family members. We are all children of the first man and the first wo woman. Adam and Eve, they sin, and everybody who exists today, no matter what your skin color is, no matter where you're from, no matter what job you have, you have that same issue. I have that same issue. It's the problem of sin. And our iniquity, our rebellion is offensive. It's despicable to a holy and a righteous God. 
And just as these Jews in our text were punished for their sin by being taken into exile into the Assyrian Empire, we will all be punished eternally for our sin by being taken into exile into hell one day unless we come to repentance. There must be a change of heart. There must be a change of mind. There must be a change of direction. And if you're going to receive eternal life, you must place your complete confidence in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. You must abandon every other form of hope. No good works. No, I grew up here. No, this is my, what my parents did or this is what country I'm from. None of that. Those things don't matter. You must place your complete confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone and what he did on Calvary's cross. You must seize Calvary for yourself. You must appropriate that to your own being. Seize it. Take it. As the old hymn says, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. That's the only means of salvation. That's the only means whereby someone can gain eternal life and be accepted as righteous before God the Father. Otherwise, you remain in your own righteousness in his presence if you don't accept Jesus Christ in his son. And unfortunately, your righteousness is not good enough because as many good things as you may try to do, you've done bad things. And God's righteousness is perfect. It's holy. One sin cannot stand in his presence. That's why you need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And only his righteousness can cover you and allow you to be seen as acceptable and sinless before God the Father. But you must accept the glorious gift that God offers through Jesus Christ, his son. Otherwise, as Jonathan Ed Edwards said when we first began this message, otherwise, quote, your guilt in the meantime is constantly increasing and you are every day treasuring up more wrath. Close quote. Every day that we live, Without Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're adding more wrath from God to our plate because there's more sin. Every day there's more sin. Every day there's more sin. And only Jesus Christ, the Savior, can cleanse from all sin. Full stop. May no one leave here today without having the assurance that your sins are forgiven and that you are God's child and have trusted in him, trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation. Life is dreary. The situation was dreary. But thank God for Jesus Christ and the gospel that is available to human beings today. And may all who hear this message have the confidence of knowing that they have responded to, the, responded to the gospel, and they are God's child. Let's pray together.